All right, friend, if you're struggling with driving anxiety, which is something that I struggled with for many years, I want to encourage you to join me for my free live class. In this class, I'm going to be diving into what overcoming driving anxiety actually looks like, and I'm going to be teaching you lots of practical tips that will help you to experience more peace and freedom behind the wheel. And I know you might be thinking, Shannon, I've tried and I just can't do it. It's so hard. And this is why I want you to join me. I want to show you that it is possible and that it doesn't have to be so hard. So for all of the details and to sign up, just head to the link in my show notes and save yourself a seat. And if you join me live, I'm going to be doing a Q&A at the end of the class so you can get your questions answered right on the spot. But if you can't attend live, no worries. You'll get a replay directly sent to your inbox. I hope to see you there. I think that piece of like, when I first said like, I don't feel okay, because I was putting on this face like, I know how to do this, I've got it, this is great. Um, That was the first step just to say like, this doesn't feel okay, I don't feel like myself. That kind of set me on the path to starting to feel better. Welcome to a Healthy Push Podcast. I'm Shannon Jackson, former anxiety sufferer turned adventure mom and anxiety recovery coach. I struggled with anxiety, panic disorder, and agoraphobia for 15 years. And now I help people to push past the stuff that I used to struggle with. Each week, I'll be sharing real and honest conversations along with actionable and practical steps that you can take to help you push past your anxious thoughts, the symptoms, panic, and fears. Welcome. You're right where you're meant to be. All right, today is a very special interview because I'm chatting with somebody that I know personally, and I'm going to let Sarah introduce herself, but to give a little background, Sarah and I met a couple of years ago at the OBGYN practice that I currently work at, and she is just such an amazing individual with lots of knowledge and wisdom to share. So Sarah, before we dive into our topic of postpartum anxiety, can you just start by giving us an intro to who you are and what you do? Yeah, um, I am a licensed clinical social worker um, who has worked in the field of perinatal um, mental health for, uh, gosh, I'm like about, well, pretty much my whole career. Like even in undergraduate school, like my first internship was at a um, a teen parent center. And I've always really been fascinated with the whole process of birth and motherhood and parenting. Um, so I kind of built my career around that. About seven months ago, I left the OBGYN office to start a very small private practice. Um, but prior to that, for about 11 years, I was in, integrated into the OBGYN practice where, as you know, where you work. Yeah. So cool. And I am just like, I love, you know, connecting with different people and the different work that you do. And like, honestly, I never knew that this even existed. And I'm sure that a lot of people don't know that there are people who specifically help women, you know, with perinatal support and just postpartum. And I am so excited for this conversation because I know many women are needing this sort of support and don't even know that it exists. So (laughs) let's just start right off the bat. What is postpartum anxiety? Well, it's part of a group of um, you know emotional experiences women can have that used to be referred to just as postpartum depression, um, but now it's more referred to as perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Perinatal because that encompasses not just the postpartum, like after the baby's born, but also the whole um, you know the pregnancy. And then mood and anxiety disorders, because, you know, what we've found is more than just the depression of like, you know, feeling like I can't get out of bed or crying. You know, I'd say it's more prevalent that women experience anxiety. It's like sort of this feeling of dread and anticipation. You know, I think sort of the, the and like the, the heart of anxiety is that feeling of like something bad is about to happen, but I don't know what it is. Um, so mm. yeah, postpartum anxiety is often feeling like I can't let the baby out of my sight, um, having difficulty sleeping because the mom's constantly checking the baby, um, feeling like a failure. Um, yeah, I think that, that kind of encompasses it. There's a lot of nuance within that realm, but. Yeah, there's so much to it. And I know like the more we dive into conversation, it'll help to, you know, uncover what postpartum anxiety is. Um, so 
I know I polled my audience and they were really curious. And I know when you struggle with an anxiety disorder, which is, you know, what my community um, is based off of, people are really concerned. Like, you know, I struggle with anxiety and if I become pregnant, am I going to struggle with postpartum anxiety? And so I know that this is a big question for many women and pregnancy and everything that comes after is very scary. So maybe we could talk about just what are some risk factors of postpartum anxiety? Mm -hmm. Well, the the biggest risk risk factor is having had a prior um, diagnosis of depression or anxiety. So that is a factor, but like you and I talked about before we started this, like not everyone who experiences anxiety will have an exacerbation after they have a baby. Um, but that's a factor. And then also um, major changes during the pregnancy, like, you know, or during the pregnancy or soon after having the baby, like, you know, changes in a job or um, moving to a different home, um, any significant losses can be a factor. Um, women who struggle with infertility um, are at a higher um, risk mm-hmm. for postpartum anxiety. Um, and then some women who are really sensitive to hormonal changes, um, like women who have um, struggled with hormonal shifts around their menstrual cycle or with taking contraception, they might be at a higher risk for experiencing anxiety after having a baby. Yeah. I'm so glad that you included like the the stressors, the big life events. Like if you have, you know, a lot of stress in your life and a lot of things going on, um, that can definitely contribute. Um, but what you alluded to, so before we jumped on the interview, Sarah and I were talking a little bit about my experience and it was just really surprising to me that I never struggled with postpartum anxiety. Like, and to me, it's still a little bit mind blowing that like I didn't struggle with it. And I honestly didn't even think about it. I didn't even anticipate it until I was having a conversation with my therapist at the time. And I told her that I was pregnant and she, you know, was sort of went into the conversation of, oh, support groups might be really helpful for you. And then it got me thinking, oh my goodness, like, am I going to struggle with postpartum anxiety? And it was just so strange to me because I didn't, I literally did not struggle with anxiety whatsoever throughout my pregnancy. And even after, of course they had like, you know, normal, natural, I'll say natural anxieties surrounding pregnancy and labor and, you know, those early days of taking care of a newborn where everything's so new, but not everyone who has a history of an anxiety disorder struggles with postpartum anxiety. So um, thank you for sharing those risk factors. I think they're really helpful. I just, it's interesting when you say it, because when you're talking about like that preparation of maybe I should know about support groups or, you know, like this, this idea of like, I could have an exacerbation of the anxiety. So what do I need to set in place? That may have been the thing that was protective because the women who have never experienced anxiety that have a baby, and then it feels like the whole world crashes and they're just like, what is this? Um, You know, they don't have the tools to deal with the anxiety or the network to be able to, um, you know, find the support. So that may have protected you some. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. I didn't think of, and and probably so. And I think part of my brain, it's just so funny that you're now saying this. I think part of my brain is like, okay, like I don't think that this is something that you need or maybe should open your mind to. Like it was really overwhelming to me. And I think that some women definitely thrive in the education that you get in support groups is amazing. But for me, I think my brain was a little bit like, okay, no, like we're not, <laughs> we're not even going to go there. We're not even going to anticipate that this might be something that you're up against. But um, it's always good, of course, to have that, the knowledge and the support. And um, yeah, I know we'll dive into a little bit more about some of our personal experiences um, caring for, you know, newborns and whatnot. So that'll be interesting too. But Um, what are some signs of postpartum anxiety? Because I know when you become a mom, everything is new. There is so much, like just so much going on. And how do you even know that you might be struggling with postpartum anxiety? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes there's sort of this alert state, which can look like, you know, irritability and agitation, um, you know, a constant feeling of feeling overwhelmed and like you, you like you can't stay on top of things. Um, I think that that overwhelmed feeling would be more of an internal 
red flag for the mom, the irritability, anger, um, they sometimes even go into these places of rage, um, which oftentimes is taken out on their partner or the people closest to them that are like, you know, completely caught off guard, you know, can be really out of character kind of rage women experience. Um, and oftentimes there's that um, hypervigilance about the baby's safety. You know, I, I used to, working at the OBGYN office, um, used to call moms two weeks postpartum to check in. Um, it was part of our protocol to screen for depression and anxiety. And so often moms would be like, oh, no, 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 I don't have postpartum depression. I'm really bonded with the baby. Like, I'm really interested in the baby. Whereas I think we gave the message with postpartum depression that that was like the big red flag is if you're not bonding with the baby or there's a disinterest. Um, whereas with postpartum anxiety, it's like, I can't let this baby out of my sight. I can't let anybody else participate in the baby's care. I got to be up every, you know, 10 minutes checking to make sure the baby's breathing at night. Um, so that's like the hallmark of that um, anxiety frequently is like not being able to let their guard down to trust that the baby's going to be okay. Yeah. And I think too, part of that, right, is like how, I think this is where the education is a big piece and where support groups can be really helpful because it's like, what is, what is, you know, quote, normal? Like, what, mm -hmm. what are things that I can anticipate that I'm going to be experiencing and feeling as being a new mom? Because, you know, I can speak to my experience when Amelia was born in those first, you know, I mean, I say the entire first year of her life was really hard for me, <laughs> but the first, you know, month was so incredibly challenging and like not knowing what to expect and really feeling like you don't know what you're doing and mm -hmm. like, how do you take care of this little baby? But I think a big part too that kicked in was like, you do have these instincts and that was so interesting to me. Like I just... Not that I knew what to do, but you sort of feel and you have this, you know, inner knowing of this is, this is, you just get, you'll figure it out and like, let's just go, you know, with it and, and we'll get better. And I mean, there's just so many factors, you know, like things, you know, from breastfeeding to sleep to, you know, just trying to now navigate, like, how do I balance all of this? Like, how do I take care of myself and take care of a newborn? And so I think this is why it's so important to provide that education of what are the signs of postpartum anxiety? Because I think there's so much of becoming a new mom that is totally natural and having so many anxieties. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because you're kind of talking about like expectation and I think like all of us, whether we're even really fully conscious of it or not, have some expectation of what it's going to look like when we have our first child or when we start our family. Um, and, you know, that usually goes out the window completely. Um, I worked as a parent educator. Like I, you know, like I said, I was always fascinated with pregnancy and birth parenting and I worked for probably six years as a parent educator going into people's homes and teaching them about caring for their infants and um, you know children up to age five. And so when I got pregnant, I was like, I got this in the bag. Like, I know how to do all of this. I'm going to be a great mom. And I <laughs> just remember the first night in the hospital, um, my daughter started crying. She was in the little bassinet thing next to the bed. And I just remember looking at her and thinking, I'm the mom, like nobody else is coming <laughs> um, and feeling completely at a loss as to what to do to console her. It was like anything I knew went out the window um, and, you know, then quickly spiraled into my own experience with postpartum anxiety was just feeling like I didn't know anything. And like you said, there's instinct. I think there is like if we can kind of tap into it, we do have some instinct as parents, but I think a lot more of what we have is like it, it, what can alleviate that anxiety is the ability to be willing to just fail, like try things and be accepting that sometimes you're going to mm -hmm. try something and it's going to totally miss the mark. And then you'll be like, okay, so next time I'll do it differently. But when there's a lot of expectation, when you miss the mark or you fail, it's like, I don't know how to do this. I can't do it. I'm never going to figure out how to do it, um, which can really, really spiral. And then there's shame, you know, women, and men too, fathers do experience postpartum depression and anxiety. Um, but I'm, you know, speaking from a, a mother's perspective, I think that shame that kicks in of like, you know, 
other moms know how to do this. Like, you know, there's something wrong with me um, can really exacerbate, you know, the, the mood and anxiety disorders. So one of the, the best things yeah. that I think women can do is start to talk about it and talk about it early and quickly um, if they start to experience any of the symptoms of anxiety or depression. Um, there's that Mr. Rogers yeah. quote. Yeah, so manageable is manageable. Um, and I think that really applies. Yeah, so good. Like truly, because I think that's where a lot of women get caught up, right? You don't, you think and you, you're right, you do have these expectations. And I think part of the expectations are, I'm a woman, I had this child and I should be able to take care of my baby and I should know what to do. And I should, you know, I think too, a big piece of it for me, and it's, it's like, I can laugh about it now, but I think as much as people tell you it's going to be hard and, you know, of course I had my mom telling me it's going to be hard and there are so many things that you're going to have to learn. You don't know until you're in it. Like you don't know the type of hard that you're up against. But also I think so many of the things portrayed on social media and just in the media Mm -hmm. in general, like to me, it it seemed like babies sleep, like little babies sleep and they're super (laughs) cuddly and they're super cute and like, (laughs) and they don't do a whole lot and you just take them places and everyone like, you know, is in awe of them and just wants to hold them. And it's like, that's not reality. And I think that's the big piece for me that I think would have been really helpful is, you know, that that's not what it looks like to care for, especially Mm -hmm. a newborn. And there's a lot of crying and there's a lot of, you know, figuring out, you know, what do I do? Like, is it mm-hmm. that they just need a diaper change? Is it that they need to be fed? Is it, you know, there is so much more to it <laughs> than I think, you know, society and, and media portrays it out to be. And I think that's part of the expectation piece is, you know, you can oftentimes have really unrealistic expectations. And I think that part of my struggle postpartum was I did have such unrealistic expectations. Like I didn't, I thought it would be like much more (laughs) easy than it is. And it's not easy by any means. So I'm so curious to hear your personal journey, if you're willing to share that, because I think, you know, like you said, you're, you were coming from a place where you had the education, you had the knowledge and you were like, I've got this in the bag. And then it wasn't so for you. So how did you navigate <laughs> yeah. that? I was really completely caught off guard. Like I remember leaving the hospital and being like, I cannot believe they think I'm going to keep this baby alive. Like they're letting me leave with her. Um, yeah, it's just everything <laughs> changes. Like your identity changes overnight. You're, um, it's not just like that you're meeting this new person who's your baby. You're meeting this new person that's yourself as a mother. And um I also think there's no way into this journey without it bringing up stuff about our own experience being parented and whether that's like, you know, things that we got from our parents that we are like, I need to do that. And we're like putting pressure on ourselves to emulate or things that we got or didn't get that were like, there's no way I'm doing it that way. So there can be a lot of internal expectation that comes up around that. Um, and it's just... I, <laughs> I remember my in the sleep deprivation again is a it can't be minimized how much that impacts things, um, but I remember we came home with my daughter and I was a bundle of anxiety and couldn't sleep, um, and also was struggling with breastfeeding. That's another big risk factor if there's um, issues around feeding the baby or you know struggles around breastfeeding, and then health issues for the baby <clears throat> or complicated birth. So I had all of those. My daughter was breech, so she was breech delivery. It was a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, lead up to that and expectation. I had a lot of issues around milk production, not making enough milk to feed her. And she had hip dysplasia, so had to be put in a brace. That was because of being breech. So I was concerned she was going to have to have hip surgery. So it was like this complete tsunami of all the stressors. Um, and I, yeah, I couldn't let her out of my sight um, and couldn't sleep. And I remember I had been spending a lot of time with um, a friend of mine who had a newborn just prior to having my daughter. And after we had my daughter, I I kept uh, calling her by my friend's daughter's name by mistake. (laughs) I remember saying, (laughs) 
saying to my husband, like, I can't do this. I can't even remember her name. And he was like, well, you're, you're bad with names and, and you just met her. And I remember when he said that, like, you just met her. It was like, kind of gave me this wave of relief. I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, I just met this baby. Like, I don't know her. I don't know yet how to console her or how to take care of her. And so I'm going to need to figure that out. But I think that piece of like, when I first said, like, I don't feel okay, because I was putting on this face, like, I know how to do this. I've got it. I mean, mm. This is great. Um, that was the first step just to say, like, this doesn't feel okay. I don't feel like myself. That kind of set me on the path to starting to feel better. Yeah, that's so huge, right? Just saying, like, I'm not okay. And I, you know, I've mm -hmm. personally had friends and know women that that's a really hard place to come to because I think there are so many internal pressures, but also, you know, these societal pressures of like, you're a woman and you should just be able to figure it out and you should be able to, you know, quote, handle it. And I think. I definitely struggled with that just in being a new mom is like, you know, you should be able to, to do this, but there is so much of becoming a new mom that is so hard and like not something that you can do on your own and just starting by saying, Hey, like, you know, I'm not myself and this is really hard and I'm not okay. Like that is, you know, the, the biggest piece in being able to get that support that you need. But I want to go back to something that you said because I like it was so powerful to me. You said not only am I meeting this new baby, but I'm meeting this new version of myself. And like that is I'm like such an emotional person and that just like made me <laughs> emotional hearing that because it's so true. Like it mm -hmm. is you're not you're meeting this baby, right? That that I think some women do form such a sort of instant connection. And some women don't, a lot of women don't experience that. So you have this new baby that you don't even know, and it's hard <laughs> to remember their name. <laughs> and like, you are now trying to figure out, you know, who am I and who am I now going to be and what it, what is this going to look like? And, you know, who am I going to become? And I can just share with you, I was in a, a grocery store and I literally ran into my step father. And I think it was like, uh, Amelia had to have been a week old and my husband was with me. Thank goodness. Cause I couldn't even function. I mean, the sleep deprivation, <laughs> you shouldn't be going anywhere alone. <laughs> um, and I ran into my stepdad and he was like, Oh my gosh, she's so beautiful. What's her name? I went blank. Literally. I couldn't <laughs> even tell you her name. And my husband, my husband looked at me and he was like, her name is Amelia. And I was like, yep. <laughs> That's it. That's her name. Like, it's just like, you've got to give yourself so much grace in becoming a new yeah. mom, a new parent, because it's so overwhelming. And like, you're in such a, like a literal fog for those mm -hmm. first, you know, few months because you're just lacking so much sleep that I think that's the other piece is like just giving yourself grace. Like you don't have to have mm -hmm. it all figured out. That's not what becoming a new parent looks like. And Right. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to talk about it. And it's okay to ask for support. Like, I can't stress that enough because I, oh, if absolutely. I, you know, if I could go back, that's the biggest thing I would change. Like, mm -hmm. just yeah. like, I don't got this. I need some mm -hmm. help. <laughs> well, I feel for people because, you know, I, I feel so fortunate that I had my children before social media was really a thing, um, you know, because now like moms and dads coming into this that are like also on Instagram and, you know, all of, you know, Facebook and these messages that you get and these the curated pictures of what it looks like with a new baby, that just puts so much pressure, you know, and that, you know, we're talking about how it's important to speak up when you don't feel like you're, you're doing okay. It's even harder when you are comparing yourself to that, you know, these images that people are putting up that are just the highlights. You know, we forget that that's not reality. Um, so I think that adds a whole other element yeah. to it. There was another thing I just before I forget when you were talking about that, like, you know, meeting that new version of yourself. People also don't talk about the grief that comes with like, any change we have in life, whether it's a positive change or, you know, a, a change that's more of a struggle change there's there's something you gain and then there's something you lose and so there's often grief around losing that part that 
person you were when you were independent and, you know, all of your decisions didn't, you know, sort of get affected by thoughts of your, your child or your family, because then I think that the connection with your partner, if you're doing this with a partner, that changes too, you know, what you need from each other and uh, what you're going to look like moving forward. So I think the grief needs to be acknowledged. Yeah, I like literally that entire time you're talking, I'm like nodding my head. My head is going to like fall off. I, I That was a huge piece. I wish that more people would talk about that because it is. You, I personally experienced such a, a – it felt like a loss. It felt like a big part of me was just like, okay, I'm going away now and I don't know when you're going to see me again. And that was like – something that hit me really hard because I was so used to being, you know, the nine to five mom who, or not mom, but just person who went to work. And I, you know, went on tons of adventures. I'm a super outdoorsy person and I couldn't just, you know, pick up a newborn and (laughs) go out and hike a mountain. And I was no longer going to the nine to five and I no longer had my normal routine. And like, just my life overnight looked so very different. And that was incredibly hard to, you know, feel like I was losing a huge part of who I was. And then I had to come to grips with what this new version of me would look like. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't, (laughs) there is hope. Like, (laughs) you know, it's, it's really hard in the beginning, but you know, now of course, you know, Amelia got a little bit older. I put her in a a backpack. We went hiking. Like, you know, I started to gain that back slowly, but in the beginning it can feel very much like, wow, like such a big piece of me has been taken away and I don't know when I'm going to get it back. So I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I think grief is something hugely that needs to be honored and recognized postpartum. Yeah. Yeah. And I think on the flip side too, there's the, there's the loss and there's the change. Um, but I was recently doing a, a storytelling workshop around writing you know, stories around birth and parenting. And one of the women was talking about in one of the writing prompts about um, who was the person in her, again, like the meeting the new you, like, and she was, had the perspective, I think her daughter was like seven or eight of like, who was the, what were the parts of me that I learned about that I never would have learned about if I hadn't had a baby and, you know, all of that Mm. amazing stuff that comes with it. You know, my older daughter, the one that I was talking about that I couldn't remember her name, she just turned 18 last week. And I am like, holy cow, like I'm on the other side of this journey. Like now she's an adult um, and I'm excited to be her mom as an adult. You know, I think we put a lot of pressure on that birth to like three or birth to five, like you got to enjoy every minute of this because you don't want to look back and you know, like, feel like you weren't mm. present. And it is a lot of work. Like that first three to five years, like it's like, you know, just backbreaking work and tiring and all consuming. And we sometimes I think we don't give enough credit. Like you have so much to look forward to. Like there are all the stages along the way. And even getting to be the parent of an adult, like that's part of the experience. Um, so it, that that early infant and uh, preschool yeah. age is not yeah. the end all be all. Right. Yeah. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I think there is such pressure. I know I have felt that so many times um, throughout my journey and becoming a new mom and that feeling like, you know, I have to enjoy every single minute of this. And everyone says it goes by so fast and you're not going to get these moments back and all of the stuff again that you see on social media. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everyone's experience is so different. And, you know, I, you often see that, you know, don't wish these moments away. And sometimes the reality is like you do. Sometimes the moments are really oh, yeah. hard. And sometimes you do say, okay, I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, like it's okay to look forward to bedtime. It's okay to look forward to, you know, when she is five and six and you don't want to rush things. But at the same time, like we are human beings. And when things are really hard, it's totally natural to think, okay, it'll be so nice when things aren't this hard. And 
yeah, like there are so many joyous moments along the way and it's not all hard. Um, And I think, you know, you have your days, but just giving yourself that grace of like Mm -hmm. every day doesn't have to be you soaking up every single minute and capturing like so much joy and feeling incredible. And like, that's just not how life is at all. (laughs) No, no. I just wanted to say um, Glennon Doyle, the author that I'm trying to remember what her most recent book was. Do you know who she is? Uh, Untamed. Yes. I Untamed. Love yes. Love she, her podcast. Wrote a, <laughs> she wrote a blog post called Don't Carpe Diem that I would recommend every parent of young children read, where she talks about like the pressure we put on, especially moms around, you know, enjoy every minute of this and how that is just completely unrealistic and how, you know, if we can, you know, instead of being like, we're going to seize the whole day, like just seize the moments. Like when you have a moment where things line up (laughs) and it's calm and you're feeling connected with your child or your children, like sink into that and like try and just like and do that like mental snapshot because you're not going to enjoy every moment, but you want to be able to remember those moments where things, you know, did kind of line up. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really good. It talks about yeah. like enjoying, like I enjoyed the experience of having parented. I didn't always enjoy every moment of parenting. Right. Oh, so good. I love Glenn and Doyle and I love like, that blog post was so transformational for me personally. And I'm so glad that you mentioned it because it is, you know, people, when people give a real and honest depiction of what parenthood actually looks like and, you know, what the expectations shouldn't be and like just giving yourself that, you know, it's okay if it doesn't look like this and it's not always going to look like Mm -hmm. this. And it's so Mm -hmm. important because I think, you know, whether you struggle with postpartum anxiety or not, there are so many things about becoming a new mom that are so, so hard. And, you know, I didn't struggle with postpartum anxiety myself, but I have struggled, of course, with becoming a new mom and and how does this look? And, you know, it's not always fun. And my friends say, if you want to know what becoming a mom looks like, talk to Shannon because she'll tell you honestly how it looks. <laughs> because they will, because they don't, you know, there's yeah. there's so much joy, but there, it's so tough. And it's, it's not mm-hmm. something that, you know, you can capture in pictures and videos and, and show people and say, this is what, you know, parenthood is like. There's so much to it and so many layers. Um, Mm. and you really have to just like learn to cherish the really joyous and good moments and let the hard moments be hard and it's totally okay. And it doesn't say anything about you or who you are, your capabilities or, or defines, you know, how you parent, like tough times Mm -hmm. are tough for everyone. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We need those friends that are really honest. Right. Right. You do. Because I think, you know, everyone has their own experience, but not everyone is super honest about their experience and that's okay. Some people talk more openly about it. And I know, you know, I've been super honest about my journey and choosing to only have one child, you know, quote, only have one child. Um, one child is a lot and it's, it's really overwhelming for me. <laughs> and so that was a really healthy decision that I made for myself. Um, but I think it's really important to be honest because especially nowadays where we do have social media and we have, you know, a lot of moms that make it look like it's glorious and that it's, you know, not as tough as it is. It's just, I don't ever want a mom like going into it and having all those expectations and then feeling like they're a failure because no matter what it looks like, you are absolutely not a failure. Being a mom is incredibly, incredibly hard. So yeah, I, I want to get into, I know that a lot of people in my community, of course, have a lot of worries about postpartum anxiety because they know that they're at risk for it. And so one of the questions that I got that I thought was really interesting was, can it show up later after birth? So I think we often talk about like, it's, you know, really common to experience a lot of anxiety within the first few days, the first few weeks, but can it show up, Mm -hmm. you know, months after having given birth? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. At any time in the first year after having a baby, you know, so I do sometimes, you know, when we'll be like six or seven months postpartum and, you know, are starting to struggle with their mood and, but we'll question like, could this be related to the pregnancy or not? And definitely, yeah, anytime in that first year. Um, 
I think there's a push for pediatric offices to do more screening and ask more questions because, you know, people see their their obstetrician, you know, at the six week postpartum mark, and then they might not see them again until they have their next annual exam. So um, the pediatric offices are where moms are going you know, repeatedly throughout that first year. So, um, yeah, I think that's important to highlight. Yeah, that is so helpful to know because I think, right, you can sort of think, you know, well, I'm experiencing this now, this must not be postpartum anxiety because, you know, you typically hear this is something that you'll experience immediately after having the child, mm-hmm. but it's definitely mm-hmm. not something that is just um, just prevalent in, that, in the first few weeks of having a baby. Right, yeah, and also during the pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know a lot of women are anxious about becoming pregnant and what that looks like in pregnancy. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's not uncommon for women. You sort of like there's the anticipatory anxiety can be, you know, related to, you know, fear of the birth process or, you know, fear of that change of, you know, are they cut out to be a mom? Um, but also just sort of like that general anxiety, um, again, failure, that feeling, I think that's sort of a, that frequently comes up, that feeling of like, am I going to be able to do this? You know, am, am I going to be a good enough mom? Um, and then worry about how that anxiety is affecting the baby in utero. I think that's it's sort of like, it's a, you know, like a, mm-hmm. a tiger chasing its tail because there's the heightened anxiety and then there's the fear of what that's doing to the baby. Yeah. And that's so helpful because I know like, you know, in the practice that, that we worked at together that I currently work at, I know that a lot of the work that you did was supporting moms who are currently pregnant. And I think that's such a big piece of, you know, getting the support while you're pregnant and working through some of those anxieties and just being able to talk to somebody and, you know, feel like, okay, I, you know, I'm, I'm, feeling heard and I can talk through some of these anxieties that I have because I think that is a big piece of it is, you know, anticipating like, what is it going to look like? It's such a big unknown. Like you, you don't know what, you know, your entire pregnancy is going to look like. You don't know what the birth is going to look like. You don't know what the after is going to look like. And so a huge piece of struggling with anxiety is struggling with the unknown. So Mm -hmm. I think that can be so huge and making sure that you're asking for that support. You know, if you're feeling any anxiety about becoming pregnant or being pregnant, mm-hmm. like there, there are resources and people um, that you can connect with to help you through that so that when you're in it, you're not like then, you know, struggling and feeling like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Like, I just have to figure this out on my own because you definitely don't have to do that. <laughs> asking the question about how women are feeling during pregnancy and soon after, you know, when I would do those calls to check in on moms two weeks postpartum, a lot of times they'd be like, yeah, I'm fine. Everything's going fine. And then a week later they would reach out and be like, wait, I I don't think I am fine. And they might not have really come to that place if no one asked. Um, I think just sort of like putting out there, like what are some things to be on the lookout for, um, sometimes, you know, sort of sparks moms to say like, wait, maybe this is something I want to talk about a little bit more, or explore a little bit more. Yeah. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. So important. So mm-hmm. I know another question that um, people had was, and I, I think I know the answer. I think you already alluded to this, but if you had postpartum anxiety with one child, does it automatically mean that you're going to struggle with postpartum anxiety with subsequent children? <laughs> No, no. And it's interesting. I mean, there, I think sometimes that can be a little bit protective if you've experienced anxiety, you know, with a first child and then with, you know, subsequent, you know, pregnancies or babies, there can be a little bit more like an awareness of like, okay, I know what to do. I know the questions to ask. I know the support to bring on board, which can help alleviate some of that anxiety. Not always. Some women are going to always, you know, in that experience, you know, a heightened level of anxiety around, which may sort of, I question if that's more hormonal then, because we don't have control of what our hormones are doing or what's going on physiologically in our body. You know, all the support in the world isn't going to change that. Um, But then also there are women that might not experience postpartum depression or anxiety in a first pregnancy that might in a subsequent pregnancy. And that could be affected by, you know, how that pregnancy or birth went or, you know, where they're at in their life at that time. 
Yeah. So let's dive into some things that can help because I'm really curious and I want to make sure that we have some time to cover. Um, What are some things I'd say? So let's start with if you are currently struggling with postpartum anxiety, what are some things that can be helpful um, in working through it? Um, Well, there's an acronym called NESTS. Um, and it kind of covers like the basic things that you need. I like nests because it's kind of like that holding. Um, I remember reading on it, it was some therapist out West, her, her blog, and she's, the tagline was, um, everyone wants to hold the baby, who's going to hold the mom? And I feel like, you know, moms sometimes kind of get forgotten about, like people come over and they're all excited about the baby and they forget. I mean, the mom might have even had a C-section. She's just undergone major surgery. And, you know, people are walking in, like swooping up the baby and kind of forgetting that the mom needs care and help. So so nests, the N is nutrition, like making sure that you're eating, um, getting some healthy food in. It's really easy for moms with anxiety to completely forget to eat. Their appetite is completely gone. Um So making sure you have nutritious food around, if that means like when someone says, what can I do to help? It's like chop up a bunch of, you know, fruit and vegetables and have that easily accessible, have some good high protein snacks accessible, you know, hopefully, preferably things you can just like grab and eat with one hand. Um, And that's especially important if you're breastfeeding and if you're not only needing to nourish your own body, but also the baby. Um, Exercise, which I, that is not like exercise, like you're working out to get back to your, you know, pre-pregnancy body. Exercise is like doing a short little walk or, you know, putting on some, you know, nice music and kind of dancing around with the baby or, you know, doing some stretching, like something, you know, that's sort of like a light nourishing exercise. Um, Sleep and rest, like lack of sleep. I mean, to just think that is like, they use lack of sleep as a form of torture in war and anybody who is sleep deprived of the new baby, like knows, like <clears throat> that's effective. Um, time for yourself, like getting a little bit of space and time just to breathe and think and, um, you know, kind of reflect a little bit and then support, like just having people around that can support you getting all those other things. So um, those elements are really important. Um Therapy, you know, postpartum depression, for someone who hasn't experienced his depression or anxiety, they, people will go back to their normal level of functioning without any treatment at all. I mean, it, could t- it takes a lot longer, but, you know, connecting up with a therapist, there's a couple of really good therapies that are effective for um, postpartum anxiety and depression. There's interpersonal therapy that works a lot around role transition and, um, you know, changes in interpersonal relationships and grief. Um, that is like really has been sort of like um, tailored to fit around that perinatal period. And then cognitive behavioral therapy, which, you know, I'm sure you're aware of is like looks at like cognitive distortions, like things in our thoughts that um, don't really from a logical level make sense, but can become truths to us and kind of being able to delve into those a little and kind of tease them apart and look at how your thought processes affect how you think you know, that. And then medication, you know, I think some moms, feel like medication isn't an option when they're pregnant or like the worst thing that people can do is if they're using medication to treat mood and then, you know, some well-meaning doctors will say like, oh, now you're pregnant, you need to come off all your medications. And that's really not recommended if that's keeping a mom in a stable place emotionally. Um, Or if you've had a history of using medication to treat um, depression or anxiety in the past, you find your mood is sort of slipping during the pregnancy, you know, going back on that medication that did work in the past um, can be really effective. Or postpartum, there are medications that, you know, are safe during breastfeeding. I mean, everything's got its, you know, risk factors, but um, sometimes weighing like the mom's emotional well-being is, you know, that's important enough to, to go down that route of medication. Oh, you covered so many good things. Like all of that is just amazing. I love that acronym. And then I love that you talked about the medication piece because I think that is so huge. I think that, you know, the education and the and the medicine world needs to be a bit better and not, you know, just removing medication from pregnant moms and, and making people honestly just feel like, 
all right, like, you know, not only is this pregnancy going to turn your world upside down, we're going to take away, you know, something that may have been working for you for a long time. And so making sure that you're advocating for yourself and just having that knowledge of, you know, you might not have to make those big changes. And there are always um, things that you can do that will help to continue to support you and that are safe to continue to do while you're pregnant. So that I'm really glad that you shared that. So can we also to um, dive into a little bit of if you're concerned because say you're at risk for postpartum anxiety, you're not currently pregnant um, and you don't have any children, but you're thinking about becoming pregnant, you want to have children, um, what are some things that can help to maybe um, decrease the likelihood of you experiencing postpartum anxiety or depression? I think just... At that stage, because you don't really know how, I mean, it's interesting because some women, your estrogen level gets so high during pregnancy that, and estrogen can kind of have some mood stabilizing effects that some women find they feel better than ever during pregnancy. Um, their estrogen level then plummets after they give birth and birth the placenta, which then can, that abrupt shift can be hard, but no one knows what it's going to be like. Like we can't predict what your experience is going to be going through pregnancy or postpartum. I wouldn't say that it would be like a reason not to pursue having a family. If that's something that you want, like absolutely like, you know, just get the supports around you as best you can and create as much stability in your life as you can. Um, and then it's just like we talked about with parenting, like you don't, you don't know until you're there. Um, so you kind of, we, we walk into this experience kind of, you know, blindly on some level, like we can, you know, I always say like, I was the best parent in the world until I had kids. Like we think we know everything and then you just get in there and you, <laughs> kind of, you, you flounder through, you figure it out. And, you know, back to what we talked about in the beginning, you need to be willing to like, you know, make some mistakes and not do things the right way and then switch course and say, okay, no, that was, that didn't work. So I'm going to try something else. Um, and like you said, give yourself a lot of grace that, you know, we're imperfect beings figuring our way out as we go through this life. And, you know, starting a family is like one of the biggest, it leads you down some of the biggest changes you're ever going to experience. So yeah, willingness, willingness to just, reach out for help and try different things and go easy on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So important. And I think too, you know, when people often ask me, when in your journey did you make the decision to, to have a child? And for me, I did a lot of self-work and, and healing before I had Amelia and it was a very conscious decision. I, you know, was in therapy. I had been in therapy for a number of years and I needed that support. And I knew that this was potentially something that was going to be coming down the road and something that I wanted. Um, and so I made sure, you know, I was paying attention to my habits, uh, my daily habits. I was paying attention to, you know, the decisions that I was making and how much stress I had in my life and just the basics. Like you even mentioned, um, you know, when you're in that new mom phase of making sure that you're eating well and giving your body nutrients, like all of that basic stuff, you know, for me personally, I knew that I had to be in a good place before I made that leap. Um, and just having the support and making sure that, you know, I was making healthy decisions and that I was in a place where I felt like, hey, there are a lot of unknowns that are going to come my way, but at least I feel like I have the support in place and I have some tools and I know that I will be able to um, to reach out and ask for more support or um, I'll be able to work through it if I do run up against challenges. So not every pregnancy is planned. Like I think only about half of pregnancies are planned. So, you know, just if someone who has struggled a lot with anxiety finds themselves pregnant unexpectedly and is like, okay, I'm ready to like, I'm just going to go with this. Like the, you got nine months before that baby comes. So there's a lot of time to put those things in place. All right. Well, Sarah, we have covered so much and I am so glad that you joined me for this conversation. It has been incredibly helpful. I just want to ask if there are, are there any resources for women who are currently struggling with postpartum anxiety or depression, um, any good 
sites that people can go to or any resources that you know of that are really helpful? Yeah, the um, one of the best resources is an organization called um, Postpartum Support International. Their website is postpartum.net. And they, if you want to learn anything about um, emotional and mental health during pregnancy or postpartum, they've got a ton of resources. And then they also run, I don't know, there's probably like 50 to 100 support groups. They're all online um, and they're, you know, people from anywhere across the country can join, but they cover all kinds of topics um, and they are even in different languages. So that's a great resource. And there's a local state chapter of Postpartum Support International. Um, yeah, that sort of covers that covers anything that you would want to know about um, mood and anxiety disorders postpartum. And it includes dads. There's resources for family members who are concerned if they, you know, how you can be a good support. Um, or the other thing, too, is now, um, you know, a lot of OBGYN offices do have integrated clinicians like what I was doing when I was there with you. And uh, so that can be a really good resource or speaking up to the um, pediatrician, because I think there's, you know, with there being more knowledge and, you know, more awareness around how prevalent this is, you know, the providers are really stepping up and making sure they have resources. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me today. It was a great conversation. Thank you. I, I'm so glad you covered this topic. And before I end this episode, I want to mention that I'd really appreciate it if you shared this episode or any others with somebody who you feel could benefit from what I share here. You sharing these episodes is what helps me to reach and support others who need it. And if you have an extra minute in your day today, I'd also really appreciate it if you could leave a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts. I read every single review and this too is what helps me to help more people to heal and overcome. All right, until next time, friend, keep taking healthy action. I hope you enjoyed this episode of A Healthy Push. If you want more, head on over to ahealthypush.com for the show notes and lots more tips, tools, and inspiration that will support your recovery. And if you're hoping for me to cover a certain topic, be sure to join my Instagram community at A Healthy Push and let me know in the comments what you want to hear next.